Dear friends, as our peace gong calls us together on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent, let us gather in worship on this holy day, and you're invited to have your bread and juice ready for communion later in the service, and light a candle or more to create your worship space. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship our God. Grace to you and peace. As we come to worship on this holy day, we remember that Easter is two weeks from today, and together we are making the journey toward the cross and beyond to new life. Yet this is our Sabbath day, our holy day, for which we give thanks and enter into the mystery of all that is holy. Let us come now to worship and reflect on the meaning and purpose of our lives, and also consider who we are and whose we are as God's people as we offer our voices in song and reflect on the words to our hymn for this holy day, as we are created to be in community and communion with God. Amen. We come in this holy season of Lent to be strengthened and empowered by God to see our lives more clearly and follow in the way of Christ's love. Let us now offer our confession in this sacred time. Forgiving God, we confess that it is uncomfortable being confronted by the cross of Jesus Christ. Too often we do, not do that which we do not want to do and fail to do what you would have us do. Forgive our sins and create within us clean hearts to live with commitment and courage in the way of the one whom you send to show us the way. Amen. Dear friends, even as the shadow of the cross grows imminently longer and reminds us there is no such thing as casual Christianity or comfortable commitment, still we have the assurance that God will give us the strength and the courage to love and serve and offer forgiveness for all of our sins and shortcomings, and nothing will separate us from God's love through Jesus Christ. Let us sing our response.
I invite you to hear now these words of scripture from the Gospel of Mark, shared by Matt Pariseau. Hear now these words of scripture from the Gospel of Mark. Now, when Pilate handed over Jesus to be crucified, the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole band of soldiers. They clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of his purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Goloth, Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. May God bless the reading of these holy words. Amen. Will you pray with me? Most holy God, may the words of my mouth, the reflections of all of our hearts, be faithful to the gospel reading for this holy day. Amen. In this faithful congregation, we have so many ordinary, extraordinary people who in quietly, seemingly unspectacular ways demonstrate some rather spectacular faithfulness. On this fifth Sunday of Lent, the last Sunday before Palm Sunday, we're moving closer to the cross. The cross that was made years ago by Neil Abelson, it rises toward the sky with purple cloth attached outside in front of the sanctuary as a symbol of our church's Lenten journey for all who drive by. And here on the altar is the cross from Haiti brought by Reverend Daler from Haiti, carried back carefully by his hands via truck and airplanes with two connecting flights as a gift for this, our church, a powerful symbol created by an ordinary yet extraordinary artist in the Haitian countryside, where so many bear the cross of poverty and hunger in a multitude of ways. And today, we call to memory the man, Simon of Cyrene, son of Alexander and Rufus, mentioned in the Bible as the extraordinary, ordinary person pulled out of the crowd and compelled to help carry the cross on which Jesus was to be crucified. Today, we also reflect on the cross as we consider how the living presence of Jesus in these days enables ordinary folk like us to bear it with Christ, if we choose, and thus participate in the great drama of faith being enacted among us in these holy days, among us as we draw nearer in our faith journey. I think a lot about all the little people of the gospel. I'm talking about all those seemingly insignificant little people who briefly step onto the stage of the drama of Jesus, briefly play their parts, and then are never heard from again. I'm thinking of the widow who dropped her one small coin into the temple offering and was noticed by Jesus, giving all she had out of love. The little boy who offered his few loaves and fishes so that Jesus could feed the multitude, giving all he had out of generous compassion. The centurion who at the foot of the cross proclaimed Jesus as the Holy One from God, risking all that he had out of conviction. I'm talking about the people who rate scarcely a couple of verses of scripture, those little people often unnamed, whose lives we know mostly by their reflection in the light of the life of Jesus. Reflecting on those little people interests me because they describe most of us. Most of us will not merit a book about our lives when our story is told. We're ordinary people living in little out-of-the-way places who go about our lives doing the best we can. As I say in communion, bringing all that we are and all that we hope to be. Yet even as ordinary people, most of us are those just trying to follow the Holy One, to follow this Holy One in ways that we pray will make a difference, often bearing the cross of suffering and pain ourselves, but also with 
and for others as Jesus did. In the next two weeks, as Jesus moves toward his cross and the great cosmic drama of our faith is being worked out, the spotlight falls briefly on this before-mentioned man named Simon of Cyrene. Totally unknown, but remembered by name because that day some Roman soldier pointed toward the crowd on the sidewalk and said, you, come over here, help this prisoner drag this cross up the hill. So it will be that Simon of Cyrene is remembered by us as that one helping to bear the cross of Jesus. And we also remember that Jesus told us that we must take up the cross and follow. So on this fifth Sunday in Lent, we name the ordinary bystander, and we can take Simon to heart as perhaps a parable or a symbol for ourselves. When we stop and realize that we are asked to bear the cross in ways that will create the love of Christ in a tangible way. As a pastor, I'm often greatly moved by the simple, unheralded, unspectacular, but deeply faithful ways in which so many here step up and take up the cross of Jesus in tangible or sacrificial ways. The commitment of a pledge, the memorial gifts, the care of our grounds around the building, the person whose weekly income is less than $100 a week yet tithes 10% because this church cares and welcomes everyone. As ordinary people following Christ, it's our commitment to learn how to be anti-racist and our learning more about how we can foster new understandings and relationships and actions. It is the ordinary people here who help our neighbors. One of them helps the neighbor suffering from a debilitating disease. It's the ordinary, extraordinary person here who shares time and talent and treasure and helps Jesus carry that cross. Well, we recognize that these are moments of bearing the cross, offering our time of commitment or sacrifice or our willingness to learn and to grow, perhaps in time. One of you sent me a beautiful story recently about a woman whose name is Diane and has been bedridden with multiple sclerosis. And her friend and caregiver, Connie, comes every morning to begin the long routine of exercising and bathing Diane's, who is her severely paralyzed friend. The sun's rays slant, slant through the blinds, washing the room in a soft golden glow. The folds of the covers haven't yet moved because Connie had pulled them around Diane the night before, yet she can tell her friend has been awake for a while. Are you ready to get up yet? No, not yet, comes the weak reply from under the covers. Connie sighs and smiles and clicks shut the door. The story is the same each dawn of every new day at this apartment. The routine rarely changes. Sunrise stretches into mid-morning by the time Diane is ready to sit up in her wheelchair. But those long hours in bed are highly significant. In her quiet sanctuary, Diane turns her head slightly on the pillow toward the corkboard up on the wall. Her eyes scan each thumbtacked card and list, each photo, each torn piece of paper carefully pinned in the row. The stillness is broken as Diane begins to murmur. She is praying. Some would look at Diane, stiff and motionless, and shake their heads. She has to be fed everything, pushed everywhere. The creeping limitations of MS encroach further each year. Her fingers are curled and rigid. Her voice is barely a whisper. People might look at her and say, what a shame, her life has no meaning. She can't really do anything. But Diane is confident, convinced that her life is significant. Her labor of prayer each and every day counts. She is sharing her time as prayer, and that is her commitment to bear the cross. Her sacrifice and love for those in need of her prayers and in her prayer time to give of herself. With her daily prayers, she moves mountains that block the paths of those out in the mission field. She pushes back the rain of darkness 
that too often claim the alleys and streets of the gangs. She aids the homeless mothers, single parents, abused children, despondent teenagers, handicapped boys, and dying or forgotten elderly in the nursing home down the street where, from where she lives. Diane is on the front lines, firmly believing that she is helping to hold up the weak, inspire doubting believers, energizing other prayer givers. This humble and quiet woman sees her place in the world, and it doesn't matter that others may not recognize her significance in that grand scheme of things. She's carrying the cross and is significant in the mind of God. For her and for each of us, our life has depth and meaning and purpose in whatever ways we serve. We are all given the chance, like Simon before us, to take up the cross. I'm glad Simon was there on that fateful day when Jesus moved toward Calvary. I'm glad that Simon kept, his story was kept alive in that Gospel of Mark. In the week and, half that, and a half that we walk behind Jesus as he goes to the cross, stares evil in the face, confronts the principalities and the powers, and gives his life for love, on the way to that cross, we ordinary people have the privilege to commit ourselves and find the tangible ways to carry that cross of love. And together, we, together, create a crowd that lives the compassion and the caring of Christ in our world with the courage to give of ourselves, all of us, heart, mind, and spirit, time, talent, and treasure. Thanks be to God for calling us to live the light and the love that radiates from the cross. Let us now sing our response beneath the cross of Jesus. now share our mission concerns and church family announcements. Good morning or afternoon or evening whenever you are watching. Welcome and we are so happy to have you with us today. We are a faith community that lives out our faith together through all that we do and we especially want you to know that your health, safety, and staying connected are our highest priority. As part of our mission concern for the environment, we do co continue to collect Massachusetts bottles and cans. Please drop them off in the bins located at the top of the Fall River Avenue parking lot at any time that is convenient for you. And we are having a Lenten Zoom journey through the Bible on Thursday, March 25th at 6.30 p.m. I will include the Zoom link in my emails a few days before the 25th. I hope that many of you will attend as Reverend Joy guides us on a journey through the Bible. Please have a Bible with you, and if you do not have one at home, you could borrow one from the church. You can either contact me or the office, and arrangements will be made for you to pick it up. And you still have time to purchase Easter flowers. We ask that you send in a check for $10, which in include the names that you would like to honor or to purchase in memory of someone. The deadline for that is March 28th, and we will decorate the altar for Easter. 
and we will have Holy Week services. We will have a virtual Monday, Thursday, which will be released on Thursday, April 1st. We will have a virtual and an in-person service on Friday, uh, April 2nd. And we will have a virtual and in-person Easter service on Sunday, April 4th. We ask that you register for all in-person services. Our sanctuary is a safe space. Seating is every other row. Masks are required. Doors and windows are open. And thank you to those that are continuing to either email or send in their weekly pledge or give online. We are so very grateful for that. We are in the middle of our stewardship campaign and happy to report that about 45% of the pledges have been returned. Please enjoy your week. Be safe. Continue to wear your mask and reach out to others. Happy spring to everyone, and I hope that you are in good health and spirits, and I will see you again next week. And now, Stacy Inman will share a stewardship moment. Hi everyone, my name is Stacy Inman and I am here to share with you my What the Church Means to Me story. So in the last almost 13 years since I joined the church, um, that What the Church Means to Me has definitely changed over the years with my family changing and myself changing. Um, so now my two oldest boys are 14 and my youngest will be 13 next month. And my why originally started with looking for a community for myself and for them so that we could both um, make new friends. Um, at a young age for them, that was very important because they stayed home a lot of the time um, and didn't have a whole lot of social interaction with other children. For me, as a mom of three young ones, I was looking for um, women who could relate to what I was going through. And in the last couple of years um, that why has pretty much you know been the same but over the last year since um, everyone's lives have changed and we have had to do things a little bit differently I would say the thing that has um, been the most important to me is staying connected with um, our church family and I think we've done a pretty good job of, of figuring out what that looks like and how to do that um, and it wasn't something that I realized I was missing until I had it back again so um, having three children and um, a very busy household, even when we aren't going out playing sports and doing other things, as you can hear in the background, um, we have adopted um, five new birds and four new cats over the last year. So there isn't um, any lack of things to keep me busy, but um, probably back in, I would say probably in the April or May time frame. Um, once we had all kind of adjusted to being um, in our new normal, um, Kristen and I were talking about having a, a meeting with the Board of, of Christian Education just to get everybody together. We didn't have a robust agenda like we usually do. Um, it was really just more about checking in with everybody and catching up with everybody, which I think is kind of where everybody was um, for a long time through this pandemic was just checking on people, making sure they were okay, seeing how they were doing with all the change. So. We put out some different dates and said, you know, what works for everybody. And at, at that time, nobody had a whole lot going on. So I think we decided on a Saturday morning. Um, I said, you know, just kind of come as you are. Bring your coffee. Let's just sit and catch up. And it wasn't until I saw, I think we probably had about 12 of us, maybe even more than that, on that morning. It wasn't until I saw everybody's faces that I realized that how much I had missed that. I had done a good job of filling the time um, with things at home and my kids, but I hadn't, I had missed that camaraderie. I had missed that catching up time. I had missed that what's going on in everybody's lives. And of course, things again were very different. Um, we were all filling our time a little bit differently. I've been working from home. I still am. My children had been learning from home for a few weeks and still are. Um, and we got to share those stories. We got to realize that we're all in this together and that we'll get through it together and you know sharing some tips and tricks and other things that people were doing just to kind of get through the days that looked really different for everybody um, and that being probably the most difficult for um, for the children who are used to their routine and seeing others and being in a classroom setting learning so again my my why for the church and what it means to me has definitely evolved and changed and I can't believe I have a seventh grader and two eighth graders right now you know finishing up this church school year 
virtually, um, but it's working. And, um, you know, having been in the classroom with them and, and seeing them learning in person um, and being able to take that learning and knowledge and transfer it to virtual has been great. Um, Kristen has done a great job of helping us kind of take these ideas of how to do things differently and put them into action. Um, and I can't believe I will have you know, two in the confirmation class next year um, and one finishing up in the classrooms in eighth grade and um, looking forward to what that next chapter will bring for all of us um, as my you know time has been spent with them in, in one capacity learning um, in community um, with the church to see where do we go from here you know to have two in high school and my last one in middle school will, will definitely be another why and another um, you know place for me to to lean on those who have done this before me and uh, kind of help me get through the fact that my three little ones are, are now growing up and um, have grown up in this church setting. So that is um, kind of where I've been with my, my why and what church means to me and looking forward to what the next 13 or so years bring for us. And thank you, Stacy. And now Betty and David will sing How Beautiful. Mm -hmm.
As we come before God in our prayers today, please pray for all of those who are listed on our prayer concerns. We grieve with all who have lost loved ones, especially the family of Robert and Raffaella, Debbie and Bill, for all who are in the midst of treatments or recovering from COVID or strokes or from surgeries, for all in rehab, all with cancer concerns, all who are caregivers or struggling with health concerns for addictions, depression, and isolation. We pray for all of those who are shut in, all those who are social distancing, for all of those in our communities who face hardship and fears, loneliness, or anxiety, for teachers, students, families, those alone, for all who are caregivers or working in hospitals or essential workplaces, all who are risking their lives for others. We pray for our country and the changes that are so crucial for peace and justice in our land. And we pray for the challenge to allow the love and peace of Christ to inform our everyday living. Let us now be in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Most holy God, we thank you for your presence and power. We thank you for this faith community and for calling us to be your family of faith in this place and time. And on this holy day, O oh God, we pray for the courage to be faithful, even though it will often be at the cost of our comfort. We pray for serenity to undergird all decisions and actions, for commitment to support the unsteady in our midst. We pray for a willingness to speak truth to those in power and to trust what is just. We pray for a seriousness about growing in our faith and a good humor to sustain our efforts. We pray for a dedication to mission that is personally involving and a love that merits being called Christian. For we seek to be your servants for the sake of Jesus Christ, O oh God. And we pray for all whom we name in our concerns this day, for all who are scared or anxious or fearful or grieving, for all in need of your strength and comfort, grace and mercy. Make us instruments of your peace, channels of your love, and open to gratitude and hope, O God. And we ask all of our prayers in the name of Jesus the Christ and offer to you now the prayer taught to all of the followers as we say together, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Dear friends, we come now to the table of our Savior, Jesus Christ, bringing all that we are and all that we hope to be. We come remembering how on that night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and giving thanks, blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this always, remembering me. In the same manner also, Jesus took the cup and giving thanks, blessed it and said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, which is the covenant of love. Do this also, remembering me. Ministering now in Christ's name, we give you this cup and this bread. And while you are partaking, please share in singing, let us break bread together on our knees.
Let us pray. Life-giving and loving God, we give thanks that you have nourished us at this, your table. And we pray that you will continue to guide us to live in Christ's love with hope and perseverance, with peace, compassion, and new life. Amen. Now let us sing on this fifth Sunday of Lent a hymn that is traditional for us. Are ye able, said the Master, to be crucified with me. share together our words of parting. God, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born into eternal life. Let us sing together the World Peace Prayer, our song of parting. Lead us from death. peace of Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us as we go forth to love and serve and carry the cross. Amen.